episode 183, featuring the second part of my interview with the founder of SSI, Mr. Joel Billings. This part of the interview, we talk more about the early days of SSI, their war games, uh, his uh, work with Danielle Buttonberry, one of my favorite designers, basically everything up to the gold box games of the late 80s. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Joel Billings. I've got a viewer question here. I, th I think this would be a good opportunity to uh, put it in. So this is from Vaughn Deronymus and Pulver Congan, and they want to just they want to know how did SSI create so many video games? Uh, well, you know, we, we didn't follow our business plan. That's the first thing. Our our business plan. We had this 100 page business plan. We had it all worked out. We were going to have this room full of programmers, and we we're going to do all these games and. Uh, uh, and Dan, Dan Button, later Danny Button, uh, you know, blew that up when he sent in a game uh, about three or four months after Bismarck came out. He sent us Computer Quarterback, or what became Computer Quarterback, and uh, asked if we wanted to publish it. And then uh, Charlie Merrow sent in the Computer Air Combat within like a month of that. And so I started thinking, wow, people are going to send us games that we can publish? You know, we can work on and publish their games. We don't need to hire all these programmers and, and do it all ourselves. And that's really the, the success story of SSI and the secret of SSI. We didn't do it ourselves. We, we became the publisher. We became what Avalon Hill was. If you look at Avalon Hill and SPI, which were the two big war game companies, I think uh, my, my sense is that uh, SPI was more internal and Avalon Hill was more external. And in terms of finding people out there, you know, designing games. So anyway, we switched our business plan within six months of releasing Computer Bismarck to, you know, we're going to publish other people's games. We're going to do a few games ourselves internally. We had a few programmers, but I'd say 80% of our games were outside uh, design. So we, we became very quickly uh, a company that wanted to be able to react quickly when somebody came in with a game. Uh, and be very flexible, work with them, provide whatever help we could, you know, and uh, uh, that was really the, the secret to SSI, so over the years. You mentioned Daniel uh, Bunton Berry, mm -hmm. one of my favorite designers. Uh, did you work uh, closely with, with her, or I guess him at the time? I did, yeah. Uh, I mean, Computer Bismarck, uh, Computer Quarterback, I'm sorry, was... Uh, one of my favorite games. That was really one of the first sports games. You know, computer quarterback and computer baseball were two of our biggest sellers in the first five years of SSI. And they were, if you think back, they were two of the first sports games. They didn't have the graphics that you ultimately would you got later on, but they had amazing design features. Like uh, quarterback had, uh, Dan, Dan had uh, used paddles and on the Apple and you could actually see the X's and O's of the play call line up. And then based on that, you, you could audible. And both sides could be audible in offense and defense. So it really it was unlike Stratomatic, you had this real time component to it at a point where computers were still very simple, you know, very early in their in their <laughs> progress. And that was a, a really fun part of it. So as a Stratomatic player, I just I fell in love with this game right away. And it had all the statistics behind it, but it had that real-time element. So anyway, yeah, I worked a lot with him on that. And uh, he did uh, Cartels and Cutthroats, which was our business game. Which See, we, we really quickly decided, you know, I wanted to be like Avalon Hill. I wanted to publish all kinds of strategy games. So not just war games. We published a political simulation game, an election game, and a business game, and sci-fi games, and, you know, anything that was sort of strategy. So... Anyway, uh, Dan, unfortunately for us, we lost him to Trip Hawkins. And that's like its own story, which we can go into if you want to. But, uh, you know, he went on to do lots of games with Electronic Arts. But, yeah, no, he was great. He was a great designer and fun guy. Well, speaking of real-time uh, games, I come across one uh, from your, what's the word, game library, I guess, uh, Combat Leader. Oh, yeah. Uh, debuted in 83. This was for the Atari 8-bit and the C64, and I really like the marketing slogan on this. A real-time war game so fast, you'll ask, is it live or is it SSI? <laughs> 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 Can you talk a little bit about this game? Uh, yeah, it was before its time. 
Uh, I mean, it really was. It was a real-time strategy game before real-time strategy games, you know, were were out there. There were two games. There was that game, and there was Broadsides, and which was a real-time ship, you know, wooden ships, and Iron Men game of you know just one-on-one -on -one ship combat. They were both real-time games, and uh, Combat Leader was yeah. You had you saw individual tanks and and little men, infantry, you know, moving around. On the screen, uh, good Atari graphics, and uh, uh, it was simple in that the data behind the game was very simple uh, compared to something like Steel Panthers later on, where you had all the incredible detail of the weapon systems and the armor ratings and the speed ratings of all the weapons. It was you know sort of numbers from one to nine. You know you 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 know you, your armor rating of one to nine. You had your gun rating of one to nine. It was very simple that way. So, but. The, the gameplay was really one of the early um, uh, real-time strategy games, which, of course, you know, became huge later on with, you know, Warcraft and, you know, uh, World of Warcraft, whatever, uh, all the games that came later on. But it was in about, what, 1984, 83, something like that. So it was a good four, five, six years. And I'd say it's it's unfortunate from SSI's point of view that we didn't do more of that, you know, but it wasn't... That was the that was the downside of SSI in a way because we didn't have a big inside internal staff of programmers. We didn't have artists until 1987 or 88, and so you know we were pretty much at the mercy of what came in, of you know what games were being submitted, and you know we were actively trying to solicit games and designers and so on, but we. Uh, it wasn't like we we could say okay we want to do you know real time. War game now. Let's go out and do it. We just didn't have the the capability to do that. Well, Car Carrier Force is another game uh, released in '83. I actually have the uh, the copy back there. And one thing I love about this and a lot of uh, the SSI games are the boxes. You know, just really magnificent boxes. They look great on the uh, the shelf. And I'm wondering, uh, was that something that you uh, insisted on, or that you? Yeah, well, that you was, wanted to see. Yeah, that was thanks to Louis Seikow, who was. Uh, the art designer for virtually every game that SSI ever did. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, it goes back to I wanted to be like Avalon Hill. And Avalon Hill had really nice boxes, box games or bookshelf games, you know, nice stuff with nice copy, nice photos on the back, info on the games. So when I first made Computer Bismarck in December, we, we realized, okay, we're going to have to publish this ourselves so we need to make a box so somehow through my office made at Amdahl because I was still working at Amdahl part-time while I was running SSI basically he knew somebody who was an artist and that was Louis Seikow and he introduced me and he was uh, you know a Stanford student uh, he graduated from Stanford and uh, sort of a starving artist you know wanting to, to get started and it was a perfect relationship because he did all those designs he did a lot of the paintings early on later on he would commission paintings but he was a great graphic designer so you know a lot of the the SSI logo he created the SSI logo he created all of that stuff so and funny thing is early on about 1982 while he was doing all of this for SSI he actually got a full-time job at Activision I think it was for like a six months or a year but and he still did all the SSI stuff on the side while he was doing that but uh, so he created his own design studio and basically uh, did all of the SSI covers. So, yeah, you can thank all of that to, for Louis. Do you have a personal collection of all your boxes from I, all of your I, games? I did until we, we moved and my wife said, you know, I had to get rid of that. Yeah, we had a, at, at SSI, we had a, uh, a collection of every one copy of every game ever published. And then we had a wall of fame sort of, which was a wall at SSI that had every box that we of every game. So it was like 150, 200 games up there at one point. And when at one point when SSI was sold, I think you know it became part of Mindscape, which became part of Learning Company, Mattel, and went to Ubisoft. It finally it was getting closed down, and so I think uh, one of the people still there, Brett, you know, said, "Do you want these boxes?" Said, sure, send them to me because <laughs> so, they were getting rid of them. So he shipped me, and I ended up with like 30 boxes full of boxes. And uh, my wife freaked out. <laughs> and so 
I think I ended up sending a bunch of them to Chuck Krogel. So Chuck may have them. Chuck was our uh, VP of R&D for a long time and, and ultimately president of SSI in the last couple of years when they were in, uh, inside Mindscape. And so he probably still has a bunch of them. So I'm down to about 10 or 15. So. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering in general about your attitude towards uh, graphics in general. You know, I was thinking uh, nowadays when you hear about a game being realistic, they're always talking about the graphics. And whereas back in uh, the SSI's day, you're talking about a realistic game, that meant the, you know, how much attention is paid to the, the right. ships and the planes and everything. So I'm just wondering, uh, why do you think this happened? Do you think the games have been uh, dumbed down over the years? Well, it's there's different markets, and you know the 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 mass market, the consumer market, is a different market than the one we were dealing with back in those days because we had a very select crowd. I mean, you looked at the demographics of war gamers and the demographics of early PC owners, and they matched up very well. And so that's why we could do as well as we did in, in the early days, because we had the natural audience there. But, you know, as, as PCs went out to everybody and video games literally went out to everybody, uh, you're, you're dealing with a different different audience. So, you know, you still have the grognards, we call them, you know, the, the serious war gamers who want the detail. And sure, they, they, they're used to having good graphics and they, they expect a certain level of, of graphics, but that's not the main factor. But for 90% of the video game world or 95%, you know, that's sure, they're going to look for good graphics. So, I think that was just a natural evolution of the opening up of computers to everyone, as opposed to just being the the nerdy war you know chess club or game club crowd. That's one thing so, I admire about you, Joel. Is you seem to have not betrayed the, your roots, right? You've stuck to this sort of hardcore audience all along, even up to the present day. I mean, were you yeah. ever tempted to go that other way and start making really flashy arcade-like games? No. No, so not really, <laughs> not personally. I mean, we did at SSI, we made some, we tried to do some games that are a little more flashy and so on. And certainly some, you know, some of the things like the, the great uh, Eye of the Beholder series was the real time, you know, games and so on. But me personally, you know, my interest is still in the strategy games and the war games particularly. And so that's what I wanted to do. So when I had the, you know, Luckily, I have the ability to, to do what I want to do, and that's those are the games that I want to work on and play because I spend I spend hundreds of hours playing the games that I make, so I want it to be something that I want to do. So it was different when I was running SSI. You know, as a publisher, it was one thing, but now we're just a design group, so we get to do the games we want to do. Well, in the 1980s, SSI began doing uh, role-playing games. We've got Wizards Crown, Questron, and Fantasy. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, about those games. And then in particular, my friend uh, Bill LaJudas is a huge, huge fan of the fantasy uh, series, so I definitely want to talk some about those. Mm -hmm. So uh, what made you want to make this uh, transition into doing uh, role-playing games? Well, it was, it was two things. Uh, one, we started getting submissions from people uh, to do, you know, with fantasy games. So... Uh, I know I had only played Dungeons and Dragons literally once in my life and, and a high school DM killed me off very quickly. And I thought this is the stupidest game I've ever seen. <laughs> and so I never had anything more to do with it, even though a lot of my early war game friends were, were into D and D, but, uh, so I, I didn't have any personal interest in it, but we had some people in the company, uh, Paul Murray and my roommate at the time, actually one of our programmers and Keith Broers. Uh, they were big role-playing gamers. They played D&D, &D, they played Champions, they played all kinds of you know, paper role-playing games. And so they had the interest in those games. And then we had Questron submitted to us, Fantasy submitted to us, and it was a natural. So I think we actually started having Keith, Keith worked on Fantasy, if I remember right. I mean, I worked on those too, because at the time I was working on every game that SSI put out, but... I didn't have the fantasy, you know, experience, your RPG experience that those guys did. So Paul and uh, Keith started working on them and, and helping those developers. And then they came up with the idea for uh, Wizard's Crown, which was their tactical combat fantasy game. So that was, you know, one of the few games that SSI internally did, because basically Paul and, and Keith were our internal department at that point. And uh, so it was sort of, a, it was a natural 
evolution of SSI because most strategy gamers played role playing games as well. There's a big correlation. And because we had those guys in the office, it, it was natural. So we felt like we had the ability with them to to put out some good games. So and then it just sort of snowballed because we had Questron, Fantasy, Wizards Crown, and they did well. And then we got lucky to that uh, our sales, uh, our VP of sales uh, found out that uh, the TSR people were looking to license D&D. And when we found that out, it was like, wow, that'd be great, you know, the, to have the D&D license. So at that point, we put the full court press on and we, we flew back to, in 1987, uh, flew back to Wisconsin and made a presentation. At that point, they were talking to uh, Origins, they were talking to Electronic Arts, and we convinced them that because we had people like Keith and Paul who were really into D and D and role playing, that we could do the best for them. And we were the serious war gamer crowd. And D and D really came from, you know, the same, like I say, the same serious war gamer crowd. Chainmail. But yeah, yeah. I mean, tactical TSR, the company that made D and D. You know, their name is Tactical Studies Rules. I mean, that's what TSR stands for. It was really a tactical uh, combat system, from what I understand, that was the beginnings of what became D&D. So you, you started with tactical combat, and you say, okay, now what do we do with this? Well, let's put all that role-playing <laughs> around it. So that was na a natural. I think, yeah, I think it's you know very natural. I think it's one of the reasons I love those uh, gold box games. And going back a little earlier to uh, Wizard's Crown, mm -hmm. just the emphasis on these, this really uh, magnificent combat uh, that was a lot of fun in and of itself. You know, it seems like a lot of the later role-playing games, uh, the combat's almost, you know, busy work. It's not really the... Right. To me, it's not nearly as fun as this this, this earlier style. Right. Well, the, 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 the gold box games are really trying to do what D&D &D is, which is a miniature, started out as a miniature combat system. So, you know, that's what it was trying to get at. It, it wanted to have that same combat feel and it really was wizard's crown that and keith and 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 paul that uh that gave us the end for being able to do that and keith keith was the as far as i remember the main programmer on uh the gold box series and uh that was uh it really was a connection of the war gaming because you know miniatures we all the other thing we did around the office was we played miniatures, whether it was Civil War miniatures or Ancients combat miniatures. We had all kinds of miniatures going on, and then the guys playing role, you know, role playing. Really, there was gaming going on all the time in SSI. I mean, those are the fond memories of SSI were, you know, a bunch of guys in their 20s and 30s are basically sitting around making games during the day and playing games at night, and uh, you know, that was it was really a. My wife called it the a treehouse for war gamers. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the third installment of my interview with Mr. Billings. And yes, we will get to the gold box stuff then, so just stay tuned. I know you're going to enjoy that. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show. Uh, guys, it takes a lot of hard work to make these episodes. And uh, while it's uh, certainly fun, I also would appreciate your financial support to keep the, the show going. Uh, you can uh, set up a donation or subscription of any size. Uh, just go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner of the page. You can donate a dollar, a dollar per week, a dollar per month, uh, whatever you want. All I ask is that you... Uh, take a look at that and decide what the show is worth to you. Really appreciate it, guys. I um, also want to remind you about the uh, Kickstarter a Wild Man Evolutionary uh, RPG. It's a project from Chris Taylor. I interviewed him last episode, and if you missed that one, you really should go back and watch it. I think you'll re really be uh, uh, pleased uh, with the way that interview turned out. Very emotional stuff there. Uh, he's doing a lot better now. The uh, Kickstarter project's about halfway to its goal with uh, two weeks left, so I'm pretty optimistic. I uh, Just remember, guys, you should uh, go over there and uh, pledge uh, to that Kickstarter. If the project does not make its goal, uh, you're not out any money, so there's really no risk here. And I'd really like, like to see this game uh, made and gas-powered games uh, continue. It's a really good man at the helm. Now, what about that Ale of the Week? 
Uh, this week I have a very special, uh, another one from Herbert uh, and uh, Brewdog, but uh, this one's very special to gamers like us. This is the Tokyo, it's an 18.2% alcohol level, Intergalactic Fantastic Oak Age Stout. Now you might remember I had the Tokyo uh, Rising Sun, I think which was a special version of this. It wasn't too good, uh, so I'm hoping this one will be better. It says here on the back, uh, this is a beer inspired by a 1980s Space Invaders arcade game played in Japan's capital. The irony of existentialism, the parody of being, and the inherent contradictions of postmodernism, all so delicately conveyed by the blocky, pixelated arcade action, have all been painstakingly recreated, recreated in uh, this bottle's contents. Now, how the hell do they do that, I ask? Uh, this imperial stout is brewed with copious amounts of specialty malts, jasmine, and cranberries. After fermentation, we then dry hop this killer stout with a bucket load of our favorite hops before carefully aging the beer on French toasted oak chips. And it goes on in that vein for another paragraph. A lot of text, uh, but let's get it open and see if it lives up to the uh, Space Invaders theme. All right, so I got the Tokyo here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this and quite enjoying it, actually. Uh, you know that, you know, the uh, Tokyo Rising Sun, uh, something was wrong with that, and it had a very industrial sort of uh, chemical smell. Uh, this, on the other hand, uh, night and day. Uh, this smells wonderful. A lot of uh, berry aromas here, kind of like you're just smelling a... Uh, a basket of cherries and some blueberries. Uh, very nice. Uh, let's give it a taste and uh, here's to you Herbert. Uh, thanks again for all of these uh, Blue Dog Ales. It's been a lot of fun trying these out. Oh, 18.2%. Oh. <coughs> oh, that, that is not a lie. Uh. Hmm. It's very, uh, very, very, very strong ale. It tastes like it's almost <laughs> a 30 or 40 uh, percent or uh, 100 proof. Uh, very strong. It tastes more like wine uh, than beer, actually. A lot of uh, berry flavors. Uh, I'm tasting a lot of cherries and blueberries. Uh, not so much the cranberry, but suffice it to say it's very, very sweet and very, very pungent. A very strong ale. Try one more, a little sip here. Yes, very, uh, this is probably one of the sweetest ales I've ever tried. So I guess if you want something strong and very, very sweet, uh, this would be a good choice for you. Uh, not a lot of kick uh, to it, at least an alcoholic taste. It kind of just bowls you over with these cherry and berry flavors. Then you start to feel the alcohol more than taste it, I guess you, can, you could say. Maybe I should end this before I start to feel it even more. Uh, anyway, uh, quite tasty and interesting, uh, so I'm going to go with a 4 out of 5 drinking horns on this. Uh, quite nice, definitely way better than that uh, Rising Sun that I tried earlier, so uh, very nice uh, selection here. I don't know what it has to do with Space Invaders, but I dare say uh, your score would not be very impressive if you drank too much of this while trying to play. Alright, uh, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for a, a good military quote, and I came up with one from Mr. Napoleon Bonaparte. And it goes something like this. You should change your tactics every 10 years if you wish to maintain your superiority. See you guys next week. <laughs> Dad, why are you laughing? I do not know. But it was a wonderful feeling.